Hello once again, friends, neighbors, and fellow Christians, and welcome back to our ministry here at What the Bible Says, where we are studying and researching from the Word of God, and we are applying the Berean principle that we read about in Acts chapter 17, where the Bereans were more noble than Thessalonians because they searched the Scriptures daily to see whether or not the things they heard were true. And so this is what we want to do in comparing spiritual things with spiritual, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 13, and so that we do not go beyond what is written. We must keep things in context as we have been demonstrating lesson after lesson after lesson in this series that we are continuing and drawing to a close regarding the last day's kingdom that was foretold by Moses and all the prophets that it would come in the last days. And we have demonstrated numerous times that this was the last days of Old Covenant Israel, the last days of the Mosaic Age, that it was drawing to a close during the first century, during the ministry of the apostles, and it came to its uh, conclusion, its telos, its suntalia, at the time when every stone of the temple was thrown down, which is exactly what Jesus said in Matthew 24, when he predicted the end of the age, the Mosaic Age, and the sign of which would be the removal of the Jewish icon, that is, the Jewish temple. Because as long as that temple stood, then the way into heaven had not yet been uh, made manifest or opened, as we read there in Hebrews. And so, again, let me thank uh, all of the viewers and the uh, new subscribers, and I just pray that you will continue with us in studying, and even after we complete this particular series and move on to something else, that you will continue to study with us. And I appreciate uh, the comments. I appreciate those of you who take the time to share the video, hint, hint. And uh, again, if you're a first-time uh, viewer of this particular channel, again, please go right down there and hit that subscribe button. Click on the bell notification so you'll receive uh, notifications as we upload uh, new videos. And so uh, in the last lesson of this series, we concluded our study, our parallel study in Romans, paralleling it with what Paul is teaching in 1 Corinthians 15 regarding the resurrection, which was one of the promises associated with the coming of this everlasting kingdom. And so as I stated in the last uh, lesson, I thought I would do one lesson on the judgment because the judgment was another one of the promises and in respect of punishment it was a threat but that was one of the promises that was associated with the coming of this kingdom as was the second coming of Christ which we don't really need to go into that because we've covered that uh, many many times uh, throughout the course of this uh, series of lessons and so then we want to look at uh, a few thoughts. Uh, again, this is a, a big subject, and there's no way that we're going to cover everything just in one little short video. Um, so short's the operative word, ha uh, But anyway, um, we're going to look at just a few thoughts, and this is going to be primarily just to point you in the right direction, and we're going to deal, again, specifically with the timing. The timing foretold by the Old Testament prophets as well as the New Testament prophets. And so we're going to start right here in John 14. And we're going to look at, now we're familiar with this because we've looked at it uh, many times through the course of this series of lessons where Jude asked Jesus, how is it you will manifest yourself to us and not into the whole world and not into the world? And Jesus said, if a man love me, he'll keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now, again, we've discussed this extensively in previous lessons. But now notice that he says in verse 26, the comforter, now he says, verse 25, these things I've spoken unto you being present with you. Now see, he's telling them he's going away. But he says here in verse 26, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, notice, 
whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, this is such a huge principle that most people overlook. And that is primarily the reason that when they approach the study of the New Testament, they try to disassociate it from the Old Testament, divorce it from the Old Testament, dichotomize between them, and they try to interpret the things we read in the New Testament, what we know as the New Testament, based on our current surroundings. But we've got to see this principle here. This demonstrates that what the apostles were teaching is what Jesus taught. That's what he says. The Comforter would come, would bring all things to their remembrance that he had said. All right? You got that? And so, what the apostles taught, and even things that we can see that were being practiced by the early church, of necessity was things that the apostles were teaching them to do. And even the things that they were doing incorrectly, then they were being corrected on those things because the Holy Spirit was guiding them. All right? This is why that I've said so many times that the New Testament is Holy Spirit's quotation, interpretation, and application of his own words spoken by Moses and the prophets. All right? So now, I want us to go to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. And notice here. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, that's the strangers scattered. That's the diaspora. All right? Peter addressing specifically the ten northern tribes. Whereas James actually says the twelve tribes. Okay. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanct... And that's the, the idea of predestination right there that we talked about in the last lesson. God didn't handpick one person to be saved and another to be lost. It was through his foreknowledge of everything that he foreordained Israel, all Israel that is, would be saved through the remnant. And this would be inclusive of Gentiles. All right, so we elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit and obedience. Oh boy, there's that ugly word again. So many people try to avoid. And sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, there's an allusion to the high priest going into the holy place, most holy place on the Day of Atonement. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again into a living hope. Remember, in Ezekiel 37, they said our hope is gone. It's dead. <coughs> but now they have a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, the word to be revealed is a verb and the noun is found in verse 13, uh, the revelation. Okay, so th this is all talking about the same thing. All right. And Peter says, here that this this salvation is ready to be revealed. That's what Paul said in uh, Hebrews 9, 28, that they who look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And then he goes on and says in chapter 10 that uh, yet a very, very little while he that shall come will come and will not tarry. So again, these scriptures are dripping with eminence, first century eminence. All right, wherein we greatly rejoice, though now, that's Peter's now, for a season, if need be, you are, present tense, in heaviness, why? Through manifold or many or various trials, temptations. 
that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it is being tried, present tense, it is being tried with fire. Okay? And again, that's what we read in Revelation, and you see the verse on your screen there, and you see the other verse in Revelation there on your screen, that this hour of trial, this fiery trial, was about to come when Revelation was written, but yet Peter writes that it is occurring right then. All right, and you can compare this again with Zechariah 13, 9. You see it on your screen. We've covered this many times, which Paul appropriates in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, which I don't have that note handy, but we pointed that out recently. And even in Malachi 3, uh, verse 3, the same idea, uh, he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. And again, James wrote, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. And let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, lacking, wanting nothing. All right? And so he says then, though it is being tried with fire, it may be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing King James Version. This is the same word that is used. Apocalypsis, I believe, is the word. And please forgive me for the pronunciation of that, but we try to call it something. So th this is the same word. And the New King James corrects that mistake there. This is the revelation. At the revelation of Jesus Christ, just like it is in verse 13 you see right here. All right. Whom, having not seen, you love. In whom, though now... You see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Receiving, and again this is in present tense, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. That's what he said right here in verse 5. It is ready to be revealed. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Now notice that. Notice the audience relevance here that Peter says you and he's not talking about me and my kids and my grandkids he's talking to them his audience the diaspora searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them that's the prophets did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow unto whom it was revealed again that's the verb that not unto themselves, that's the prophets, but unto us, they, the prophets, did minister the things which are, present tense, now, present tense, reported unto you by them. Now, hang on to that. Reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you. With, now notice this, with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Now that's the tie from John 14 and verse 26. That the Comforter would come and bring all things to their remembrance whatsoever Jesus had said. And here Peter is saying to the diaspora, the ten northern tribes, that the gospel that was preached to you by them with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Okay, now hang on. I'm going to read the next verse and then come back to this. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end, for the grace that is to be brought, and that's in present tense again, unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And again, this term here with the definite article, the is identical to what you find in the book of Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Same phrase. So Peter is talking about the same thing. The revelation is speaking about, which is the Olivet Discourse. All right, so now, the reason I come here is because I want to ask you the question, who is this them who are the men that have preached the gospel 
who are who's that group referring being referred to by this uh, plural pronoun them and the reason I'm, I'm asking this is because in a somewhat recent uh, discussion there was a man who uh, popped up and said that uh, Jesus was a false prophet and that Paul was a liar and a deceiver of course he said that after I pointed to Paul's writings where he said Jesus was, uh, knew no sin, there was no guile, no sin found in him, and so forth. And so then he resorted to, well, Paul was a deceiver, so he couldn't trust those things. And so I asked him, I pointed to John 14, 26, about the comforter. Okay, he agreed that the original apostles, which would include Peter, were inspired by the Holy Spirit. So I came to this verse right here, and cited this verse, and I said, now who is this referring to, and more specifically, does the plural pronoun them include Paul? That was my point. And so then I went to this passage here, where Peter, inspired of the Holy Spirit, wrote, An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. And so when I, when I pointed this out, that Peter, as he admitted, was inspired of the Holy Spirit, said, Paul wrote of all these things that Peter was saying, then what Paul was saying was inspired of the Holy Spirit. And that's been over a week and I haven't heard from him since. But this is how we establish things. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you this to demonstrate, number one, that this is how we prove things. We don't just say it. We don't just give our opinion. We prove what we're saying through exegesis of Scripture. And because I wanted to show you that Peter, and as we even look at verses 1 and 2 here, the second epistle below, and I now write unto you in, in both, which I stir up your pure minds for a way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, so that's essentially what he says in 1 Peter chapter 1 that we just read. You see, and we cannot ignore the fact that when you look at Acts chapter 13, there at the church of Antioch, that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, said, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And so, again, this just adds... Uh, more reinforcement to the fact of what I have just demonstrated from what Peter says that Paul's writings were in fact inspired by the Holy Spirit which brings us back to my original statement that Paul said he knew no sin there was no sin in him and so that that refuted this gentleman lock stock and barrel okay so now <clears throat> since Peter said that he is reminding his audience of the things that were spoken before by the Holy Prophets, I want to go back and look at Deuteronomy chapter 32. Not all of it. Take the time to read all of it. But I'm going to uh, just hit part of it here to get some thoughts. Verse 1. Give ear, O you heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, and as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass, because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is he. They have corrupted themselves, their spot 
is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. Now, you have to get the backdrop here because Moses is teaching this song. This is the song of Moses. He is teaching this song to Israel. At this particular time, all Israel, because Israel had not been divided into separate kingdoms. So he is addressing all of Israel at this particular point. And he says, they have corrupted themselves, which is what Jesus says in Matthew 16, 4, a wicked and adulterous generation. See that? And their spot is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse, and Jesus uses that word, in Matthew 17, 17, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. A perverse and crooked generation. And we find Peter referring to Israel on the day of Pentecost using this same terminology and with many other words. Did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Same word. That's from the Septuagint, of course. Paul uses the same word in Philippians 2.15, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst, in the middle, of a crooked and perverse nation. So you see how Paul is drawing on what Moses says right here in verse 5 of the Song of Moses. 2 Peter 2 and verse 13, regarding those uh, false prophets whose damnation of a long time slumbers not. He says, They shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to write in the daytime. Notice, spots and blemishes they are, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Jude concurs. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are, without water carried about of the winds, trees whose fruit withers, without fruit twice dead plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all of their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And so again, we see this terminology being used by the New Testament uh, prophets guided by Holy Spirit. Verse 6, Do you thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that hath bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? Well, again, Paul addressed Israel as being foolish in Romans 1 and verse 21, which we have studied at the beginning of our study with Romans. Again, he says in Galatians 3, 1, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? But notice this idea here where he says, Is not he thy father that hath bought thee? Well, remember that Paul, in addressing the Ephesian elders there in Acts 20, 28, said, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. See that? And again, that's what Peter says, the verse I just referred to earlier. There were false prophets also among the people, as even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. See, they would deny... The, uh, that they had the Lord had, that had bought them there. So again, Peter is citing from the Song of Moses. That's why he would say a few verses later that he's reminding them of the words spoken before by the holy prophets. All right, remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. And he says, 
when the Most High divided the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. And we find Paul drawing on this statement in Acts 17, there at Mars Hill, where he says that, you know, God is not, he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He says he has made of all, he has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. See that? And then you go right on down. And he says that he has commanded all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he is about to judge the world in righteousness. That's the Greek present tense verb mellow there. That he is about to judge the world in righteousness. All right, so now drop down to verse 20. And we find, And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their latter end shall be. For they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. Again, refer back to what we just said regarding verse 5 and the connections of Acts 2.40 and Philippians 2 and verse 15 that you see on your screen. Verse 21, They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. And I will move them to jealousy with that which are not a people, the Gentiles, I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Now, you think about the time lapse between this point and the time by the time that Isaiah came, and we find Isaiah saying the same thing about Israel. I have spread out my hands all the day into a rebellious people which walketh in a way that is not good after their own thoughts, which is what Paul said in Romans 1.21 that we just quoted. A people that provokes me to anger continually in my face, that sacrifices in gardens and burns incense upon altars of brick. Again, Paul applies that during his ministry, which I didn't have that verse handy, but we've covered that many times. And he says, I will provoke them. They provoke me. I will provoke them to anger. Now, Paul appropriates this very prophecy in Romans 10, 19. But I say, did not Israel know? First, Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. You see that? He's quoting the song of Moses. Then in chapter 11 of Romans, I say then, had they stumbled that they should fall, God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come to the Gentiles. Why? For to provoke them to jealousy. See that? Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, that's Israel after the flesh, to whom the promises were made, Romans 9, 3 and following, and might save some of them, Paul says. And then we find... Peter saying, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in times past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Verse 22, for a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with their increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. And so we see this fire mentioned in Malachi 4 and verse 1, and we'll come back to that a little bit later in the study. But again, the fire, we find Jesus talking about this fire that will never be quenched in Mark 9, 43 through 48, where he says there, I think, three times that they'll be cast into hell fire, uh, and that's Gehenna, that shall never be quenched. We find Paul talking about the Lord coming in flaming fire, which he is quoting verbatim from Isaiah 66, 15 and following, the last days, day of the Lord coming in flaming fire, but some would escape that day and then continue to carry the gospel to the Gentiles, which, and you see it in your text there, we've covered that many times. But this is that fire. And again, this is what Peter is talking about in 2 Peter chapter 3, that he says specifically in verse 11 that the dissolution 
of the heavens and the earth was already in progress. Verse 11, present tense. Again, we've demonstrated that. I'm just showing you the connections. And then in Hebrews 12, 29, that the, the new heaven and, and the coming of the kingdom, Paul says our God is a consuming fire. And then remember that Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees there in Matthew 23, he called them uh, a generation. He said, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how shall you escape the damnation of hell? And we'll come back to that a little bit later. So hang on to that. All right, he says, I will heap mischiefs upon them. I will spend my arrows upon them. Verse 24, they shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and with bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with the poison of serpents and of dust. Drop down to verse 26. He says, I will scatter them, or I would scatter them into the corners and would make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. But notice the language there. I would scatter them into the corners. Well, Hosea said that I will sow her unto me in the earth. And I will have mercy upon her that have not obtained mercy. And I will say unto them which are not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. Which is what we just quoted from Peter there in the previous passage. And again, remember, Peter was writing to the strangers scattered abroad, the diaspora. And that's what this word is in the Septuagint. The scatter is the diaspora. And uh, for some reason, this didn't tag in Isaiah 11 and verse 12, and I have no idea why. But anyway, that is where he's, he was talking about that he would regather, he would gather them from the four corners. And that's the Episuni Goge, they're gathering together unto the Lord. Again, that we've studied in previous lessons. So here he says, and he threatens that he would scatter, scatter them into the corners, but it's foretold that he would gather them back from the corners. All right? And he says, were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy, lest their adversaries should behave themselves strangely, and lest they should say, Our hand is high, and the Lord hath not done all of this, for they are a nation void of counsel, neither is there any understanding in them. Well, again, as we time lapse all the way forward to Isaiah, we find him saying the same thing about Israel. In Isaiah 26, and we've studied this, but we see there that they would see things and not understand them, while others would see and would understand them. And then he comes back and explains this a little further in the next chapter, Isaiah 27 11. When the bows thereof are withered, they shall be broken off. The women come, set them on fire, for it is a people of no understanding. You see that? Then again in Isaiah 29, Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of the wise men shall perish, and the understanding of the prudent men shall be hid, which Paul draws on in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 9. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. So we find Paul appropriating these prophecies during his ministry, applying it to the Jews of his day, the generation of his day. And we find Jesus saying that in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which said, By hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see and not perceive. Again, the same sentiment as what we've just looked at in Isaiah 26, Isaiah 27, in Isaiah 29. All right. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. Well, again, he just said they don't have any perception. And we find that same idea expressed by Jesus in Luke 12, 56. He says, you hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? And then he says in Luke 19, If you have known even at least in this thy day 
the things which belong to thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. See, they couldn't perceive it. For the days will come upon you that your enemies shall cast a trench about you and compass you round and keep you in on every side and lay thee even with the ground. Again, that's right out of Isaiah 26 and 27. And thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. That's the Olivet Discourse. Here's why. Because you knew not the time of your visitation. Verse 30. How should one chase a thousand, and two put ten thousand to flight, except the rock, capital R, had sold them, and the Lord had shut them up. Again, compare this with Leviticus 26 and verse 8. And five of you shall chase an hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. Why would that be? Because the Lord was with them. If they violated the covenant, the situation would be reversed. For their rock is not our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are the grapes of Gaul. Their clusters are bitter. So this is why you can read in Revelation 11 and verse 8 that that great city where the Lord was crucified was spiritually called Sodom. And you find the same sentiment expressed in Ezekiel 16 Verses 45 through 51, you see it on your screen. I'm not going to take the time to read it. Where Israel, both tribes, are called Sodom. And of course, Jesus said that it'll be more tolerable in the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. There in Matthew 11 and verse 24. All right, their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. And so. Um, this is where we look at where John the baptizer referred to the Pharisees and Sadducees as a generation of vipers. Matthew 3, 7. Jesus said, O generation of vipers in Matthew 12 and verse 34. And hang on to that because that's where we're going after we look at just a couple more verses here in Deuteronomy. We're going to Matthew 12. And again, Jesus said in Matthew 23, you serpent, you generation of vipers. We just quoted this a few minutes ago. How can you escape the damnation of hell? Paul appropriates this idea in Romans 3 and verse 13. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. Notice the poison of asps is under their lips. See that? So Moses goes on here. Is this not laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? Okay, remember, Peter said, he was reminding them of things spoken before by the holy prophets. And we find him saying here in 2 Peter 3, verse 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire. See that? Peter is appropriating the language right out of the Song of Moses. Verse 35, to me belongs vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time. For the day of their calamity is hand. This is projected forward now to, the lat to their latter end. And the things that shall come upon them make haste. All right, so again, we have this idea here of vengeance and recompense. Again, we see this very thing in Isaiah 65, 1 through 4. You see it on your screen. We just quoted part of that earlier. So there it is. We find the same idea. In 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 5, where Paul is writing to the Thessalonians who are actively being persecuted for their faith. And he says that it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And he tells them that they would receive rest from their tribulations, their persecutions, when the Lord Jesus would be revealed from heaven in flaming fire. Quoted from Isaiah 66 that we looked at earlier. And again, Hebrews 10, Paul appropriates this, this passage here specifically. For we know him who has said, Vengeance belongs to me. I will recompense, saith the Lord, and the Lord shall judge his people, which is the next verse. Verse 36 here, see that? For the Lord shall judge his people, see that? And repent himself for his servants when he seeth that their power is gone. 
and there is none shut up or left. And so the Lord shall judge His people. Again, that's why I'm, I'm going through this in Deuteronomy because the judgment of Israel was foretold. I don't think anybody will deny that particular point. But the fact that we see is Holy Spirit, the Comforter, through these prophets in the New Testament are bringing these things to fruition. They are taking place in real time during their ministry. And again, I just referred to uh, Acts 17 and verse 31 that he has appointed a day in which he is about to judge the world in righteousness. Now, if you go to Acts 24 and verse 15 where Paul is before Felix, you see he reasoned with Felix of righteousness, temperance, and the judgment that is about to come. No, that's not the way the King James words it, is it? But that is the, the King James left out the definite article and they completely omitted the present tense verb mellow. Paul said, or Luke records, Paul reasoning with Felix about the judgment that is about to come, which would explain why Felix trembled. Paul said to Timothy, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is about, same thing, mellow, who is about to judge the quick and the dead at his appearing, and that actually is appearing there in that verse, that is the epiphania. Or as the other verses we were looking at was Apocalypsis, Revelation. So this is epiphania. But notice that he says, and I want, I want you to notice the contrast here, Whereas Peter says that God is ready to judge the quick and the dead, Paul said to Timothy that he is about to judge the quick and the dead. So where Paul uses the present tense verb mellow, Peter uses the present tense verb hatoimus. Again, these passages are dripping with eminence that the judgment was about to occur. James 5.8 the, he said, the parousia of the Lord has drawn nigh. Grudge not against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. Again, looking at the tenses of the words that are used there. The judge is standing right at the door. And he will judge his people, folks. That's not me. Because I was never a part of Israel. And you're not either. This has specific application to the judgment of Old Covenant Israel. And that's what Daniel said in chapter 12 and verse 1, that Michael, the great prince, would stand up. He would stand for the children of the people. There should be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, and at that time, thy people. Thy people shall be delivered. Who was Daniel's people? That was Israel. All right, now, Malachi. The burden of the word of the Lord to who? Israel, by Malachi. Chapter 2, verse 8. But you are departed out of the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. That's the law of Moses. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Now again, folks, that's not me. I didn't violate and stumble at the law of Moses. I didn't violate and corrupt the covenant of Levi. Malachi 3 1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. And we find Jesus quoting this passage in Matthew 11 7 through 10, applying it specifically to John the Baptizer. So then in verse Five of Malachi 3, I will come near to you to judgment. Who was God going to come near to? To judge. Well, it's whoever had uh, been a swift witness against the sorcerer. He said, I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers. So who was guilty of sorcery? Adultery. The false swearers. Remember what they did to Jesus? Remember what they did to Stephen? And against those that oppress the hireling in his wages. That's James 5 and verse 1. 
the widow and the fatherless, the orphans. This is Israel who is guilty, was guilty of violating all of these specific commandments of the law of Moses. And God was going to come in judgment against them. Verses 16 through 18, And then they that feared the Lord spake one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. That would be the Lamb's book of life, right? They shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. In that day, when I make up my jewels, I will spare them as a man spares his own son that serveth him. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, and between him that serveth God and him that serveth not. Next verse. For behold, the day comes that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly, that's what we just read right here, right here in verse 5, Israel's violations of the covenant. He said that he would come and judge them. They would be burnt, and there would not be left root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves in the stall. Okay, again, read the rest of the text there where John is called Elijah in verse 5 that Jesus says when he came down from the Mount of Transfiguration that that was applied to John the Baptist as well. And so he says then that when their power is gone, well, that's what we see in Daniel 12, that he heard the man clothed in linen which was upon the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half, that's the three and a half years, and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, the New King James Version says, when he has uh, completely shattered the power, their power has been completely shattered, then all these things will be finished. And so, this is what I'm talking about here when we want to look at these texts that we see right here. So the first one we're going to look at, we'll just look at it right here, Matthew 3, where John the baptizer said, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now again, we've got to get this audience relevance thing. If I was standing in front of you and I am looking you right square in the eyes and I said, you are a snake. Would you interpret that to mean somebody far off in thousands of years in your future? Or would you just get the urge to smack me? Because I'm looking right at you and I say, you are a snake. You see the audience rolling? I mean, this is common sense. This is so basic common sense. But that illustrates audience relevance. John is talking to the generation of people, scribes and Pharisees, Sadducees and Pharisees, that are standing there in front of him. We have to get that point, folks. All right, so, he says, who has warned you to flee from the wrath about to come. Again, that's mellow in the present tense. And that's what we see Paul is speaking about in 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 through 16. For you, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For you also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus, which is why they had to be judged, because they murdered Jesus. And they were killing. They had murdered the prophets as well, which is what he goes on to say, and their own prophets and they were persecuting and killing Christians. He says, And they are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, which was a violation of the covenant, that they might be saved, to fill up their sins, which is what Jesus told them to do in Matthew 23, fill up the measure of your fathers. All right? And it goes right on into 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the day of the Lord, uh, the parousia of the Lord, when he would come in the clouds, that he told them that some of them would be alive and remain until the parousia of the Lord. 
But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as to prevail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. So this wrath was going to come upon them, and John is saying it's about to. All right, so let's come to Matthew 12 then, where I said we were going to uh, come to. And once again, we have to understand that when we study the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 through 25, uh, Mark 13, and Luke 21, and even including Luke 17, 20 and following, and the book of Revelation, which is John's expanded version of the Olivet Discourse. But anyway, when we study Matthew 24, I don't think there's anybody in the churches of Christ that will not freely, maybe even reluctantly, but will freely admit that Jesus, God, came in judgment against Israel in A.D. 70. And that uh, was climaxed by the destruction of the temple. And so again, just about everybody, at least within the churches of Christ, will admit, yeah, Jesus came in judgment against Israel in A.D. 70. The problem is, for them, when they make such an admission, they don't realize what they are admitting or in what they are giving up. And that's what I'm going to illustrate right here in Matthew 12. So when we look at Matthew 12, again, this is where Jesus is talking directly to the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he says, O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. All right, now, verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and Pharisees, remember in Matthew 23, he is talking specifically to these scribes and Pharisees, calling them hypocrites, pointing out how they were violating the covenant. Then certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from you. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, but there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Now, I'm not going to take the time to go through all these passages here. You can take the time to look these up and, again, parallel these things with what Jesus is saying here, especially how it's parallel with Matthew 25, 31 and following, that judgment scene of when the Son of Man would come in His glory to sit upon the throne of his glory, all nations will be gathered before him. He will separate them as a, as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats, right? There's that judgment scene. Study these passages, folks, and study how that what, and notice how what Matthew says in chapter 16, verse 27, where Matthew records the Son of Man is about to come, it's mellow in the present tense, the Son of Man is about to come in the glory of the Father. Then we find Mark using the word this generation in Mark 8 and verse 38, which is parallel exactly with Matthew 16 and verse 27. All right, so, and again, Luke 9, 26, that the Son of Man would come in his own glory, verse 27, in the lifetime of some standing there, which ties Matthew 25 to that first century generation. All right. For as Jonah was three days and nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now notice this, folks. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment, with the definite article, with this generation, and shall condemn it 
For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Do you see the train coming, folks? Again, go back to what I just said, that those who understand and will admit correctly that Jesus came in judgment of the Jews, Israel, in AD 70, they give up the fact that this is talking about the judgment. The men of Nineveh would rise in judgment with who? This generation. See that? The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation. And when they admit that Israel, that was that generation, was judged in AD 70, then they inadvertently admit that the judgment occurred in AD 70. Do you see that? Do you see how simple these things are? when we will exegete the scriptures? Just allow the scriptures to interpret themselves. And when we look at these things and we see statements like Peter said, which we referred to already, that God is ready to judge the living and the dead. The end of all things is at hand. Verse 7, 1 Peter 4. Verse 17, The time has come to begin the judgment at the house of God. And James, behold, the, the judge is standing right at the door. And again, we see, again, the New Testament is just dripping with eminence. These things were at hand. They were on the cusp of being fulfilled. They were already in the process of, of fulfillment. They were awaiting the completion of the fulfillment. That's what Peter said that we just talked about there in 1 Peter 3 verses 10 through 12. Verse 10 and verse 12 posits it in the future. Verse 11 states it's already underway. You see, we can't do away with the inspiration of Holy Spirit through Peter who said it was already underway. All right, so we're going to end our lesson here, and I hope that you will study these thoughts in connection and uh, consider that... Uh, actually, there's one more verse that I wanted to look at, and that is the verse that we've already looked at, that is in Acts 17, verses 30 and 31. Now again, notice that Paul said... He has, he has commanded all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he is about to judge the world in righteousness. Right? All right. Verse 32, that's verses 30 and 31. Verse 32 says, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, where did they hear about that? The text doesn't say anything about the resurrection. Paul said that he is ready to judge. He is about to judge. He's commanded all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he is about to judge the world. Where did they hear about the resurrection? That's because they knew that the resurrection and the judgment are synchronous and inextricably linked together. Daniel 12, 1 and 2. They knew that. But people today will, they'll use the missing word hermeneutic and say, well now, resurrection is not mentioned there, so he can't be talking about uh, resurrection. But he was talking about the resurrection because it would occur synchronous with the judgment of the world. Again, I mean, these things, are, they're, they're so beautiful and how they fit together, when we will lay aside our presuppositions and our emotions and just allow the Bible to interpret itself. It's very simple to see many of these things. And so, again, I want to thank you for your time today and studying with us, and I plan on having one more lesson. We will be concluding then uh, this series on the last day's kingdom 
that was foretold would come in the last days. And so, I, again, I thank you for your time. Please don't forget, hit the like button to force the algorithms of this platform right here to share the videos out to more and more people. Feel free to leave comments, whether you agree or disagree. And folks, let's just study the Bible. But let's keep it in context. Okay, so until our next scheduled lesson, I pray that God will bless you richly in your study of His Word. And I pray that you have a blessed day. And a Happy New Year.